Hello, and a very warm virtual welcome to this latest short course on the SOAS Alphawood Postgraduate Diploma in Asian Art. My name is Malcolm McNeil, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being the director of this program. And indeed, I'm particularly invested in this, this short course today as it aligns very directly with my own research specialism and interest in the arts and visual and material cultures of dynastic China. I'm thrilled to be able to introduce you to our speaker and convener of this short course, Dr. Edward Looper, who joins us today from Bonhams in Knightsbridge in London. Um, and in addition to his role there as a specialist with broad ranging expertise and responsibilities across the arts of China, he has in a past life uh, uh, worked on a doctoral project at Oxford University, exploring the nuances and intricacies of late Ming Dynasty poetry and madness in the work of the preeminent painter and poet Xu Wei. However, today he's launching for us a different aspect of China's art history and history, taking us in detail on a tour through the 18th century of Beijing. And I will allow him to keep his powder dry without speaking to the nuance and specificity and really frankly, widely exciting and wildly exciting range of topics, themes and subjects that we will encounter here. But suffice to say that Edward has curated for us a series of speakers and topics that will introduce us to this deeply studied, well-known and perhaps somewhat overly emphasized area of China's past in its popularity in the market and exhibitions today, but has done so in a way that will bring us new insights, new ways of seeing and pose new questions about this area. Um, and I'm delighted also that we're able to deliver this short course in association with Asian Art in London. So without further ado, Edward, over to you to launch today's short course. Thank you. Thank you very much, Malcolm. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, everyone. So um, why Beijing in the 18th century? As Malcolm explained, uh, I was actually doing my PhD thesis on the Ming Dynasty and the late Ming. And uh, the 18th century has been studied a lot, as, as Malcolm said, but there's a reason for it. it. It's truly one of the greatest eras of Chinese imperial history. And quite frankly, um, I work in an auction house also, as Malcolm has explained, and you might like Tang Dynasty silver or other dynasties and things like that, but the majority of what you're really going to be handling, the gold standard, as it were, in my industry, in my market, and for anyone interested in, in working in the Asian art world, is most likely going to be 18th century. 18th century porcelain, 18th century lacquer, 18th century cloisonne, textiles, you name it. Most of the time, uh, that's really the gold standard. And um, so for anyone who wants to work in this industry, I felt that this was really a, a key and important part. Um, also, there was the uh, exhibition at the British Museum on the 19th century. And so I didn't want to step on their toes and, and do something again, but I felt that if you want to understand the 19th century, you have to go a little bit earlier and understand what happened before it. So, um, so here we are, and hopefully I think you will enjoy it um, and, and have a good time. Um, so the Qing Empire at this time is at the absolute height. This is China at its greatest extent. Um, the population grew from 150 million to 450 million. It ruled 37% of the world's population. Um, and at its height, it was the fourth largest empire in history, ruling over 5 million squares. Only the British Empire, the Mongol and Russian empires were larger. Um, so this is a really important period. This is the absolute height. And indeed, much of the borders of present day China were really formed from this period, or at least uh, the borders of China and the Republic of China are claimed um, from this period. So, but going now, zooming into Beijing, um, the capital of this immensely great and prosperous uh, empire. There have been uh, cities here for a long time and capitals. Um, the earliest capital really uh, nearby, as we can see from this map, was of the Liao dynasty. It's the sort of blue line in the bottom left corner. Uh, the Liao were founded by the Kitans, um, from 916, they ruled until 1125. Um, and for them, 
this was their Nanjing. Nanjing means the southern capital. Nan is the south. Jing means capital. Beijing, by the way, just means northern capital, Bei and Jing. For the Kitans the, of the Liao dynasty, this was the southern capital because they were from the north, they were from the steppes, they had conquered a huge empire, uh, and they invented, in a way, the, the first uh, one country, two systems. Uh, they had a northern chancellery that ruled the northern part of their empire, according to nomadic and their Kitan customs, and the southern chancellery was ruled from their uh, southern capital, this uh, later to be Beijing. But the Kitan Liao didn't last, they were conquered by another nomadic people, the Jurchin, uh, who founded the Jin dynasty in 1115 to 1234. They were actually the forerunners of the Manchu, or at least the Manchu uh, later claimed the Jurchin to be the, their ancestors. And so you can see there they've built um, the, the yellow square kind of on top of the Liao, they're building on the foundations. But really, uh, they, they, they don't last that long. The Mongols erupt into history and conquer uh, the Jurchin and found another capital uh, for the Yuan dynasty, uh, Kanbalik um, or Dadu. And that is the pink line that you can see around here. And that's really the, the foundations of Beijing that we can kind of see today. And we're going to sort of talk a little bit about that. And then when... Uh, uh, the, the, the Mongols are pushed out, the Ming kind of build on top of those foundations, and the Qing carried on. So there isn't much of, of, of the Mongol influence in Beijing, but there are a few bits. One is the Bell Tower, which you can still see in Beijing today. If you can go there, that was founded there. And also the word Hutong. Um, Hutong is, uh, some believe, the Mongolian word for well. Um, today, it's a word to describe those narrow uh, lanes in Beijing, those sort of beautiful streets that we so often associate with Beijing. So th these are this is a Mongol word, and this is the sort of the Mongol influence. And you can see the map closely there. Um, you have the square; it's set on a grid pattern according to you know ancient Chinese ideas of, uh, of cities. And by the Ming uh, in 1368 and then Qing dynasties, they pretty much build, uh, but they move it a little bit further south. So uh, you can see that just by the lake in the top left corner, just below Dershan Gate. If we go back to the slide, you can see it again, just right next to the drum tower. So the walls have kind of moved a bit south now. And um, in the Ming dynasty, you have the forbidden city, the palace right in the middle, surrounded by an imperial city, so sort of areas of imperial uh, temples and, and, and other palaces. Then there's an inner city and an outer city. Um, the inner city in the Ming dynasty was lived in by Han Chinese, as was you know, the, the outer parts. The outer parts in the Ming dynasty were still kind of like fields, semi, uh, you know, um, semi farmland. By the Qing dynasty, when the Manchus, who are from the Northeast, from Manchuria, conquer China uh, and conquer Beijing in 1644, they move out the Han Chinese population from the inner city and they are moved to the outer city. Um, this is actually quite a sort of traumatic event for a lot of the Han Chinese. There are a lot of mansions that go dis disused and you kind of see these descriptions in ghost stories from that period that talk about fox spirits wandering uh, dilapidated empty mansions from that period. Um, so the Han Chinese are moved out from the inner city and to the outer and in their place um, they are replaced by bannermen. The bannermen are the soldiers of the Qing dynasty. And um, they were created in the 17th century by Nurhaci. Uh, they included both uh, Mongol and Han Chinese as well as Manchu. Uh, I believe personally, my, my, my idea with regards to Manchu and Han identity is that at this time in the early period of the Qing dynasty is that it was quite fluid. Um, they were an elite military force and eventually membership became hereditary and they were granted land and income supported by estates and stipends. And 
as we say, so they moved into the inner city and each banner uh, was given a section where they could sort of live. So you have, for example, the yellow uh, banner in the top left and the, uh, the, the, the bordered red banner in the top right and the, the white banner in the, the right. So it was divided into sections. And this, that's why sometimes when you see old maps of Beijing, they call this area the Tartar city. And Beijing was really a city of walls. Uh, the, the, the Chinese character, Chang, is, is sometimes interchangeable for city. And so really Beijing would have just been, um, you know, in the old days you would have seen these massive long walls. Um, these were destroyed, sadly, um, when the communists took power uh, after the civil war in 1949, they tore it down. Um, but when people arrived, they saw these walls. That was the first thing that, that really impressed people. And uh, Liu Shangyo arrived in Beijing in the 1640s and said that the walls were so lofty with parapets like sharp mountain peaks that without thinking, I murmured to myself, how beautiful the fastness of mountains and rivers. This surely is conferred by heaven. And I have um, a little video to show you for people who maybe haven't seen. This is from uh, the early 20th century, but essentially it hasn't changed from the 18th. So this really shows you old Beijing. So I'm going to show you a clip here. Um, the moat is frozen, so they're ice skating on top. But really massive walls. Here, the railway goes by so you can see it. So this is really imposing. It's the first thing that anyone coming to Beijing would have noticed. I just absolutely uh, love these old videos and these old clips, so I hope you don't mind me um, sharing them, um, although it's a little bit... And here you see the gates. Uh, I believe this is Tianmen Gate, the, the gate right at the front. It was one of the busiest. And you had three lanes entering it. The middle lane was actually supposed to be for the emperor. But here by this time in the 19th century, uh, on the early 20th, the Qing state had declined so much that everyone's just sort of using it and, and, and walking along. Okay, so we mentioned that going into sort of the geography of Beijing and how it's sort of formed, that it's formed of walls and sections and squares and residential houses in Beijing right up to the present day um, are also formed of squares. You have the hutong, which we said was from the Mongolian word for well, uh, which are these sort of narrow lanes and um, the houses that are on these hutong are called suhe yar, literally four, um, four enclosed courtyards. And so this is basically the structure for um, any uh, house in Beijing at that time. You would have had the principal house at the back and then the east, western wing and an east wing and then the front and the courtyard in the middle. And uh, there are grander ones like mansions, absolutely huge. And then there are smaller, more simple ones as well. Um, so that's pretty much. And um, here's just a, another clip of Beijing as well. Also, this is a temple fair. I just wanted people to kind of get a sense of what Beijing was like. And this is outside a hutong. We have a man shooing off an urchin. So Beijing would have just been these alleyways. He's greeting someone in the traditional Manchu way. So it's really fascinating to watch. Note also the long queues that they have, the long hair, which is a symbol of their subservience to the Manchu Qing dynasty. It's really amazing we have this film actually that preserves how people greeted each other. In temple fairs. And Beijing today essentially still uh, kind of looks 
the same, at least in some pockets. Sadly, these areas of hutongs are being destroyed um, and in some cases renovated. Some of them are now being redeveloped as sort of jazz bars or cafes and whatnot. And, you know, people have different views on that. I, I think it's a little bit sad. Um, they've been more manicured, but you can still see some pockets of these hutongs, these narrow alleys today, and that's what they, they look like. Right, so we've gone into the geography of Beijing a little bit, um, the city and how it's structured. Now, just to go into the imperial world, because this is the imperial capital. Um, it's ruled from the Forbidden City, so there is a square within the square, this massive imperial complex. Um, this is from a satellite image from Google, and um, it, it, it's absolutely, it's one of the largest palace complexes in the world, with officially apparently 999 rooms and halls. And it's from here that the, um, the, the imperial family ruled, much like actually in accordance with the principles of um, a sukha yuar, those little courtyards. So in the back is where the women and the family and, and would have been, and the front is where you would have conducted business and had audiences. There is moving out of the square, then a slightly bigger square, the imperial city. This is given to the princes and high-ranking bannermen. There's imperial gardens, storehouses, and other palaces and temples you can see there. There's uh, Beihai Park, which has a white Buddhist stupa um, built by Nepalese craftsmen from the Yuan dynasty. Um, it's still there, you can see it. And then further out from the northwest of Beijing, just to give you an idea, there's also the summer palaces in the northwest. And, and we'll, we'll come back to those later. But it's important to understand that the 18th century is dominated by really free emperors. Um, forgive me, I designed this lecture really for people perhaps who knew little about Chinese history. So forgive me if you already know a lot about Kangxi and Qianlong and then Yongzheng, but this was really just to kind of give an introduction to, to, to their reigns. The Kangxi Emperor um, is really the consolidator of the Qing dynasty. He's not the first emperor of the, of, of the Qing, but he is the consolidator. Um, earlier in his reign, um, when the Manchus invaded, uh, this period is known as the transitional period. And it was quite traumatic. Uh, uh, millions of people died. And there were a lot of people that still remembered that and still saw the Manchus as foreign barbarians, aliens. And this is actually a Kangxi period, blue and white dish. Um, it's actually narrating a story called the story of the virtuous aunt. And uh, according to this story, which was set in ancient times, actually, um, the army is, is invading and she can only choose to save her son or her nephew. And she chooses her nephew instead of her son. The army catches up with her anyway. And they say, why did you save your nephew and not your son? And, and she says, well, if I save my son, that would have been considered selfish and, and that's private matter. But nephew, that's my duty, that's my public duty. And so she's known as the virtuous aunt. Whether you believe that or not, that's another thing. Uh, by the 17th century and the Ming Qing transition, when the Manchus are invading, artists take that story and they interpret it in different ways. And you can see the woodblock uh, print from a book from the 17th century, uh, from that time, she doesn't look like a virtuous aunt that's really thrown her son there by choice. Um, it's really quite sad, you know, as in all wars. And um, but basically the trauma was still there from the Ming Cheng transition right into the Kangxi period. People still remember this and they have that painted on this dish. People looking at that dish would have known what this refers to in the war and savagery that it represented. You had artists like Bada Shanren um, still living into the Kangxi period who write their signature as uh, Kuji, crying for it or laughing at it. You know, they're, they're very critical of the Qing dynasty. They can't say anything and they retreat from the, the world and become Buddhist monks. They refuse to serve the Qing dynasty. Um, and so the Kangxi emperor has very uncertain beginnings. Uh, he starts at a very young age, at the age of eight, 
Um, he has regents until the age of 14, and the regents kind of fight each other. Uh, and and it's, it's quite unstable to begin with. And it's even more unstable when there is the largest threat to the early Qing dynasty, the revolt of the free feudatories, when uh, free um, Han um, governor officials actually rebel against the Qing empire and found their own uh, dynasty and try to push the Manchus out. Um, they ultimately fail, but Kangxi is forever marked and remembers that. And um, he writes afterwards, regarding the concealed and dejected scholars who must be hiding in forested mountains or marshes in the realm, repeatedly I've issued edicts to recruit them, enlisting their services from all directions with the intention that no talent will be left unappreciated in the fields. This is a victor trying to uh, now create peace and trying to win the hearts of minds of people. He needs the scholars, the Han Chinese scholars, to come over to his side to help him govern. And so he's very concerned with that. And so we have artworks like this, uh, Blue and White Brush Pot, which is actually coming up for sale at, at Bonham soon for 250 to 350 pounds. This uh, has a poem, the wise emperor uh, selects virtuous officials. This is a Han Dynasty poem, but the Kangxi Emperor is making a clear link between him, you know, in, in, in trying to say that I am now a scholar, I'm, I, I, I create brush pots, I am like you, and I appreciate talented people. Let's leave behind the war behind us, let's get past the trauma, let's now govern the country in peace and stability. And we see that again with Songhua inkstones. This is an inkstone that's made from um, Songhua stone, which is found in Manchuria, in the Northeast, uh, the Kangxi, the Manchu's native region. And this would have, and he's made it into a Chinese, a very Chinese scholarly item. An inkstone is what you grind your ink stick with and you use it to write calligraphy or paint, uh, kind of like a palette uh, in the Western sense. And so by using materials from the, the Northeast, from Manchuria, making them into traditional Chinese objects, he's saying Manchu culture can contribute and complement Chinese culture. I am like you, I am like a scholar. And again, he was a very shrewd man and he uh, prided himself on searching for talent. And, uh, you know, he said, I've learned to recognize the accents from the 13 provinces. And if you watch the person and study his voice, you can tell where he's really from. You know, people would sometimes lie where they said they were from uh, and things like that. And he said, talent does not depend on geographical location. Even in the mountain wildernesses, how can there be no one with ability? Have the talented ever chosen where they were to be born? So Kangxi was really trying to live and let live. Okay, we had the war, now let's try and govern the country. And he was quite successful. Um, so if the Kangxi emperor was the consolidator, the, the Yongzheng emperor uh, was really the micromanager par excellence. Well, from 1722 to 1735, there were some doubts of his succession. He was not the eldest son. Uh, but uh, towards the end, Kangxi did sort of tacitly choose him. Um, but there were always doubts around the Yongzheng Emperor's ascension to the throne and his, and his choice. Um, the reason was the uh, Kangxi Emperor's eldest son um, had some sort of mental illness and had been deposed by Kangxi himself. He didn't sort of trust him uh, twice. And so there was a sort of succession issue. So Yongzheng, when he became emperor, um, always felt he had to prove his legitimacy. Um, highly hardworking emperor, um, he revamped the imperial manufactory, incredibly detailed. He was really to the, to the finest points of porcelain and he would dictate exactly how he wanted everything. And we're gonna sort of look into that a little bit later. Um, he also initiated a system of secret reports. So whereas Kangxi emperor um, was, you know, aware that people could rebel against him and so wanted to win their hearts and minds with kindness. Um, he was willing to kind of look past corruption and bad things so long as they were mostly loyal. Yongzheng Emperor was far more in control and decided I'm gonna eradicate corruption. I don't need my, my father's old cronies around. And so he's earned the nickname as the confiscating emperor. He quite often arrested people that had uh, transgressed. He didn't look past it anymore, didn't need them and he would confiscate their objects and items. But 
uh, diligent emperor, it was said that he died uh, reading memorials. Um, but again, this doubt of his legitimacy um, made him want to be a great patron of the arts, work really hard, show himself to be a custodian of Han Chinese civilization. And he was really kind of like the emperor for everyone. He wanted to mold himself in many different personas, much like uh, you know politicians today when they want to be voted. They maybe have never gone near public transport in their lives, but they take photos of themselves using public transport to win support. And so here we see a series of paintings of the Yongzheng Emperor in different guises. Um, there's even one in the middle of him uh, as a European wearing a Louis XIV wig, fighting a tiger. There's a Taoist monk, he's a Buddhist, he's a Chinese scholar, he's a farmer, he's, you know, he's everything to everyone. He's a truly universal emperor. And then we get to the Qianlong Emperor, um, incredibly long, uh, long reign. He, if, if uh, Kangxi is the consolidator and Yongzheng is the micromanager, Qianlong is the spender. He can really enjoy the benefits and, the, the, and spend everything. He's a huge patron of the arts, as we're going to see in, in, in more detail. He encourages projects like the Siku Shu, the largest collection of Chinese texts ever to win scholars to his side. And, um, and he has the 10 great military campaigns uh, where China's borders grow to the greatest extent and can get amazing raw materials such as jade from the West, from Xinjiang. And then there's court women as well in the Imperial Palace. There would have been thousands of them. Uh, there is, of course, uh, the Empress at the top. And then going down, you would have the noble consort and then consorts and concubines, noble ladies, first attendants. We're going to have a lecture later in the series by Brett Hinch, who will talk about women in the Qing dynasty. It's going to be really interesting. Um, Manchu, uh, the, the Han Chinese, of course, had foot binding, uh, but Manchu women uh, were actually expressly forbidden from binding their feet and so had, you know, a certain amount of, of freedom, perhaps. Uh, so uh, that will be uh, discussed by Brett later. There's also the eunuchs. Um, eunuchs are men who have been castrated. Um, the reason for having eunuchs traditionally is that, that you can trust them in the women's quarters. They're not going to, to, to have relations uh, and, 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 you know, and eunuchs were blamed in the earlier Ming dynasty for their downfall. They had accumulated too much power. They were too corrupt. And so by the Qing dynasty, by the 18th century, they were stripped of the power they had in the Ming. They, they were primarily in charge of caring for women, children, and the princes. They were sort of like the caretakers. There's another group also that we must uh, not overlook in 18th century society, and that is the uh, bond servants. Boy uh, Aha in Manchu, they're literally household persons. They're kind of like slaves. Uh, many of them were humble, just ordinary employees in the palace and imperial villas and mansions and so forth, uh, taken in war uh, as, as prisoners and things like that. But some of them achieved extremely high rank, wealth and power. And that's going to become relevant later when I give a lecture on uh, the dream of the red mansions later on in this, in this, um, in this series. Uh, I'll just talk briefly that Cao Xueqin, the author of the uh, Dream of the Red Mansions, his grandfather, Cao Yin, was a bond servant and a childhood playmate to the Kangxi Emperor. And they were appointed um, commissioner of imperial textiles and their lifestyles were incredibly wealthy. So despite their status as slaves, essentially, um, they could also uh, achieve extremely high rank and wealth and prestige. So just it's also something that we have to understand. Um, along with the bond servants and the bannermen, we have in this period the rise of technocrats, people who don't really fit the traditional Chinese idea of the scholar, literati artists. They're kind of multi-talented people that rise up through the ranks because of their talent. And so you have people like Tang Ying as a good example. He was a poet, a playwright. He wrote 17 plays, a calligrapher, ceramicist and designer, um, self-identified as a craftsman, not a scholar bureaucrat. So in this time, they overturned the traditional ideas of scholars being you know, the top and literati art being the top and crafts being just, you know, and potters being crafts and sort of sub, uh, subservient to them. Here they sort of mixed everything and both. Um, 
and he really becomes very powerful during the Yongzheng reign. The Yongzheng really sent him to oversee porcelain production. Um, you get it, it's it's around this period and later in the Qianlong, because of these technocrats who can, um, under the guidance of the emperors, come up with these amazingly detailed and creative porcelain vases with pierced work. It's incredibly difficult. This is the Bainbridge vase. Uh, it was sold at Bainbridge Auction House. Many of you might remember it. It sold for 53 million pounds in, in, in 2010, and it was the most expensive porcelain piece ever. Um, it's it, it actually wasn't paid for in the end. They, they paid for half of it. And, made a settlement. But really, this is the, 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 the court style of the Qianlong and Yongzheng eras. It's, it's highly technical, brilliant, perfect, lots of different colors, extremely difficult, and, and, and all these clever things. You also see, because of these technocrats, amazing things like this porcelain um, that actually imitates wood. They're highly playful, highly creative. Um, Jonathan Hay, I believe, in his book, Sensuous Services, argues that these trompe l'oeil porcelains, these kind of tricks of the eye uh, in porcelain, uh, reflects uh, the Qing Empire's multi-persona um, sort of style. As we saw, the Yongzheng Emperor earlier portrayed himself as a European, as a Buddhist monk, as a Taoist monk, and so how things were always not what they always seemed. And so he fits these trompe de l'oeil things within Qing state power. I think they're just fun, beautiful objects. And I think the emperors were having really good fun. And there's another example of a porcelain um, tripod incense burner, but it's actually imitating pudding stone. It looks like some rock. Another one is someone like Liu Yuan, uh, who was a bannerman. He was orphaned when young, attended school, but left and drifted around moved to Suzhou and pursued painting for six years. And he found patronage by a powerful family where he did some illustrations um, of uh, portraits of Tang Dynasty chancellors, which flattered the Kangxi emperor in the preface. And the Kangxi emperor really liked it and hired him. And he became a master designer at the court. And so again, he's one of these people that neither conformed to craftsman or artisan or literati scholar, they were everything. And it's something that's very particular from this period, which leads to the kind of great bursting of creativity. Here's some of the ink stones that he designed. You can see his drawings here, incredibly detailed, really beautiful, under the direct influence of, of the Yongzheng, uh, Kangxi and Yongzheng emperors. Another ink stick as well. So you would use this ink stick to grind on the ink stone to create the, the ink. And now the imperial household agency uh, is really important for understanding art and art objects in this time. Um, they are the ones that, that really make everything. Uh, they make all the imperial porcelain and lacquer. They are independent of the regular bureaucracy. They provision and serve the imperial family, managing the workshops and storehouses, directing the empire-wide monopolies. Uh, they're controlled by the throne, but they receive and dispense funds. They get rents from estates. Uh, they are in control of the salt monopoly and the precious metals. They receive tribute. Um, and so they were immensely powerful, immensely wealthy, and could produce the most beautiful objects in the empire. They supervised the imperial factories of silk and porcelain, taking a cut from customs revenues of domestic and foreign trade. And they also had a sizable business in pawn shops and money lending. They were founded in the, the, the Kangxi era reign, um, but it's really Yongzheng who, with his micromanaging style, really revamps it. And so you don't really have detailed records in the Kangxi reign, but you do by the Yongzheng. The Yongzheng, they really record every single little thing. And so kind of want to just give an example quickly. I don't think we have time to read through the whole thing, but this is um, a bit later, the Qianlong, em the Qianlong Emperor's reign. And these are from uh, the general collection of archival records from the Qing Imperial household. So this shows you, these records will show us how uh, something was made and the process it took. This is regarding a guqin, a musical instrument, which the Qianlong Emperor uh, made in 1744, 1745. And so he 
uh, in the 10th year of the Qianlong reign, on the second day of the 12th month, a tendance seller came to say that on the 15th day of the 11th month, etc., etc. Don't worry, we're not going to read everything. I'm sorry for too much text, um, but you can look at these slides later. Um, it just shows, you know, they were ordered by imperial decree to make uh, beautifully worked, uh, bring the finest craftsmen to make a Gu Qin. The gold insignias, jade bridges, and other parts would be fashioned after classical examples, and um, they would discuss and take care, etc. Um, and on the second day, you know, the treasurer would come and present it before Qin to the eunuch for the emperor's inspection. The decree was received that the dragon pools, uh, kind of the sound boxes on the Gu Qin need not be opened, that the imperial poems be inscribed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The, the, the point is that you should get from this is that there are really, really detailed reports that we can study, which are really fascinating to, to look at. Um, and they talk about how they were made and how different workshops in the palace would have made the jade pegs and someone would have carved the wood and where they would have purchased it from and incredibly sort of detailed uh, reports. Um, I think this part is quite interesting in the making of the Gu Qin. Um, if, you, if wood was used for samples submitted to the Suzhou manufactory, it was feared that they would shrink due to their soft nature. If the Suzhou manufactory created parts in wood, they would not fit the Gu Qin. So soapstone or serpentine should be used for the parts. The stones sent to the workshops were soft, but not to the point of shrinkage. Only if the workshop fashioned samples from stone would the parts match the specification. So it's recorded. So here we can see that um, sometimes uh, models were sent in stone to craftsmen from, uh, from Beijing to Suzhou, far away, you know, thousands of hundreds of miles away. And the wood they feared would shrink. So they sent a model in stone to the craftsman and the craftsman would make it and then send it back and they would sort of put all the parts together. So these really sort of fascinating detailed reports. And then here they're showing that they want to um, uh, replicate the shape of the guqin, this musical instrument, kind of like after classical paintings. And then you know, later they they hand the uh, Gucci into the emperor and, and, and etc. So incredibly detailed reports that, that can you can read later. Uh, this how they how they made it. This is actually the Gucci that was made in 1745. It was later sold at Sotheby's for over five million pounds. So this is the exact Gucci mentioned in all those reports and how they made it. We know exactly which part where and, and what things. So quite fascinating. What this really shows is the Qianlong Emperor and the Qing Emperors in general wanting to show themselves as custodians of Han literati culture. Um, they were Manchu, they were foreign, they were perceived as foreign, but they wanted to show themselves and legitimize themselves as the custodians of Han Chinese civilization. And so they always portray themselves, uh, or in many ways portray themselves as Han Chinese scholars, like in this painting here of the Qianlong Emperor as a Han Chinese scholar with a brush in hand and all the scholars objects on the desks and the vases. And um, hence also the, 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 the commission of a Gu Qin, the Gu Qin, the musical instrument is one of the four uh, arts of the scholar along with painting and calligraphy and playing chess. He wanted to show he was part of that culture. And here's another painting of the Qianlong Emperor. Um, and actually there's two portraits of him. There's one on behind him on the screen. It's kind of a trick of the eye. It's quite, you know, it has Buddhist associations about the illusionary nature of reality, but it shows him here for our purposes with all these antiques and archaic utensils. He wanted to show himself as the protector of Chinese culture. Um, he wanted to win over the scholars. The scholars are a huge segment of Chinese, uh, well, they're not a huge segment of Chinese society in terms of numbers, their percentage is very small, but they are the most, one of the most influential. They took exams and studied the Confucian classics uh, to rise, to serve in the bureaucracy and to serve the, the emperor. And the the largest, the most wealthiest, the most successful, the largest concentration of scholars really come from this area of Jiangnan, the area around Suzhou, Hangzhou, Shaoxing. And so much of the artworks and culture, and especially furniture, was influenced by taste by these scholars from these period. And so um, 
just to kind of move away from Beijing, just so that you have an idea of what's happening in China at this time, there's in Yangzhou, another city from this area of Jiangnan, the eight eccentrics of Yangzhou, uh, these, you know, artists who uh, are really kind of breaking the boundaries of traditional Chinese art. This is uh, Jin Nong on the left, painted by Luo Ping. Jin, Jin Nong is one of the most famous uh, art, eight eccentrics of, of Yangzhou. He's considered an eccentric, or, or these artists are considered eccentrics because they uh, openly sell their paintings for money. Um, traditionally, Chinese scholars were not supposed to talk about money. That was beneath them. They're supposed to just, um, you know, uh, enjoy art for art's sake and express themselves. It's not about money, but, but these guys lived off their paintings. They also invented new sort of styles of calligraphy. Jin Nong's here calligraphy is known as kind of lacquer style because the way he brushed it is kind of a bit awkward. It's not this flowing, beautiful style of calligraphy. And the subjects are also slightly unusual. Here is a painting of a cat, which is something that you don't, again, traditionally see in, in literati painting. Other eccentrics from Yangzhou uh, at this time are Luo Ping, who painted ghosts and skeletons, much influenced by uh, Western European anat anatomy uh, books. So, you know, far from the Qing Empire being closed off from the world, there, were, there was trade and, and, and things going on between. People were aware. And another scholar, just to kind of talk briefly, most popular, probably the, the, the most significant poet of this period is Yuan Mei, um, a bon vivant um, um, who, who, who was an Epicurean. He wrote on gastronomy, ghost stories and poems. Um, he was also a believer in women's literacy uh, and took female students and helped them publish their own, uh, their own books. And here is some poems by him. He was not particularly fond of Buddhism. Buddhism, which talks about stripping desires and desire as being the, the, the root of all evil and suffering. He completely disagreed with that. He wanted to live life, live fast. And, and you know, and so he, this was his motto. This was a poem. When I meet a monk, I bow politely. When I see a Buddha, I don't. If I bow to a Buddha, the Buddha won't know. But I honor a monk. He's here now, apparently or at least he seems to be. So here he's kind of mocking kind of Buddhist ideas about reality because they believe that this world is illusory in nature and things like that. And then here, uh, Yuan Mei with his uh, female students, he's in another poem, he mocks myself for planting trees. At 70, I still plant trees, but don't take me for an idiot. Though death has always been inevitable, I don't know the date. You know, so again, this very direct, um, kind of funny, humorous way of writing poetry. He's really one of the, the, the great sort of poets of the Qing dynasty. And so these are the scholars that the Qianlong is trying to, and the Qing emperors are trying to woo over, and they're trying to enter this world of poetry, calligraphy, and painting. And what you often see is Qianlong putting his stamp seals right in the middle of paintings. He really will, you know, this is a painting from the Ming dynasty, and, and his seals are right all over it, like graffiti to say, I'm here, I was here. Um, and sometimes they're literally right in the middle, as you can see in the example in the left. Um, he also, this isn't just paintings, the Qianlong Emperor also writes inscriptions on porcelain. This is a uh, Ru ware, one of the five great um, ceramic wares of the Song dynasty uh, in the 12th century, uh, 10th and 12th to 12th century. And um, he inscribes on it, you know, again, he's putting his stamp on it to say, I, the Qianlong emperor, appreciate this traditional uh, Chinese Han civilization and culture. And I am the protector, I am the custodian. And sometimes he gets the inscriptions wrong, actually. It's quite funny. He describes things as a cat food bowl. Uh, when it was probably something else. But, um, you know, that's him putting his stamp. But at the same time, while they are, the Manchu emperors are trying to portray themselves as um, Han Chinese scholars, knowledgeable of Chinese culture, poetry, and whatnot, like the scholars, they also want to protect their own identity as Manchus. And so they often also go on hunting. And here's the Kangxi emperor who wrote a poem on hunting in the Ordos, in the, the north, um, and the hares were many. So open country, flat sand, sky beyond the river, 
Over a thousand hairs daily trapped in the hunter's ring. Checking the borders, I'm going to stretch my limbs and keep on shooting the carved bird. Now with my left hand, now with my right. Here the symbolism is quite obvious. He's hunting, he's protecting his Manchu, his Manchu uh, traditions, but he's also saying, I'm expanding the borders, I'm protecting the borders. Um, you know, anyone that dares uh, come against me, you're going to be like a hare trapped in a ring. Um, the Qianlong Emperor, of course, was a great patron of the arts, but there was also a literary inquisition. He was highly, um, all the emperors were very sensitive to scholars that were still uh, didn't like the Manchus. And so in, in the Qianlong Emperor, in his reign, um, he purged what he considered to be evil books, poems and plays. And he set to get rid of works by Ming loyalists who were writing subvers subversive and teaching histories of the Conquest. And so around 3,000, we believe, um, works were lost and then various other volumes destroyed. Uh, just to give an example of what kind of things happened in the literary inquisition, there was a poet called Tsai Xian who wrote a poem, no color is true except for red. Alien flowers have become the kings of flowers. Um, this red is also in Chinese, the surname, uh, the same name for the family that ruled the Ming dynasty. So red was associated with the previous Ming dynasty. And so and then he's talking about alien flowers becoming the kings of flowers. So um, he was seen as subversive and I, and I believe Tsai Xian was then um, actually executed for this. So there was, as well as patronage of arts and things, there was this going on as well at the same time. Heinrich Heiner, of course, says this is a prelude where they burn books, they will also ultimately burn people also. And indeed, the Chen Long Emperor has been accused also of committing genocide. He, in his great campaign in the West, pacified the Dzungar Mongols who had uh, fought him. He wrote memorial, show no mercy at all to these rebels, only the old and weak should be saved. Our previous military campaigns were too lenient. If we act as before, our troops will withdraw and further trouble will occur. If a rebel is captured and his followers wish to surrender, he must personally come to the garrison, prostrate himself before the commander and request surrender. If he only sends someone to request submission, it is undoubtedly a trick. Uh, tell them to massacre these crafty Dzungars. Do not believe what they say. And so around 70% or 80% of these uh, Mongols were killed. I believe it's quite important to look at Qianlong both as a patron of the arts, a, a great sort of emperor, but also to look at some of the, the negative things in his reign as well, to understand fully the control that they had. Um, the conquest of Xinjiang, which led to the, 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 you know, the Western regions now in China, which led to the this genocide of, of, of the Dzungars, for art historians anyway, at least is important because it led to the acquisition of jade from He Tian, Kotan, um, which was considered the best quality jade, you know, uh, this white, this is particularly typical of Qianlong, you know, beautiful, pure white jade with archaistic masks designs around it known as Tao Tie, based on ancient bronzes. Um, jade, white jade uh, had always been traded, had always come in, been precious to China, but now that the Qianlong emperor had conquered that region, there was now a steady supply. And so we in the auction house usually tell if something's Qianlong or earlier just by looking at the quality of the jade, if it's this brilliant white, this perfect, you know, really crisp finish, um, absolutely, you know, perfect. Um, we usually assume it's Qianlong or later because that's, that's when they get white. Earlier, for example, you get Ming Dynasty jades, also beautiful, but not quite that perfect white. They have different sort of shades and veins and things like that. They're also mythical beasts. They, they're not, um, you know, not quite the same. Um, his conquest in Inner Asia also led him into contact from jades from Mughal India. Uh, the Qianlong Emperor really loved Mughal Indian jades and they influenced Chinese jades. Here is a Mughal jade dish from India, actually incised with Chinese inscription. This is in the Taipei Palace Museum. Um, there is, um, you know, a, a return to archaism in the in this period in the 18th century. Um, the Qing emperors wanting to identify with the scholars, encourage scholarly um, projects like dictionaries that look into the Chinese language, and there is the search for evidence movement, the Kaozhong movement, um, and so there's a renewed interest in ancient texts. 
and inscriptions on archaic bronzes. Here we see this is a Kangxi blue and white brush pot with script um, from um, the, the, in a style of calligraphy that, that has its origins in ancient, uh, the, the Warring States period. And here we see the link between sort of ancient bronzes, the drawings, and then how they were influenced um, to, to cloisonne uh, vessels. Again, you know, the emperors wanting to show that they are the custodians of Han Chinese culture. And we see it time and time again in porcelain, in cloisonne, in everything. Uh, on the left, you see catalog, uh, the Xiqing, uh, uh, Xiqing Gu Jian, and then how the craftsmen and potters and, and makers interpreted that. And again, with cloisonne here. So during this time, there's a lot of looking back to tradition and the past and China's ancient heritage. And then you sort of get Han Dynasty um, bears. Actually, here it's described as Tang, but I think probably earlier. And then a jade replica made in the Qianlong era. And you also see it in porcelain where they create this tea dust glaze, which again is imitating ancient bronzes. The shape is imitating a bronze. Even the, the, the kind of strap work around it is imitating um, a sort of archaic you know, bronzes from Han Dynasty, uh, which in turn were influenced from Central Asia, perhaps, you know, flasks carrying water along the Silk Road and, and, and strapped uh, along that way. So quite interesting mix. Um, moving on into Beijing, Beijing was a, a place full of temples and popular gods. Um, there are numerous uh, temples and, and deities. One of them is Guan Yin, uh, Guan Di, sorry, you, you often see statues of him um, in, in the auction house. They come up quite a lot and um, he was you know, considered masculine um, and he had a lot of patronage. Uh, from the Qing elite. There is the goddess Guan Yin, who is the goddess of mercy. There are 176 temples dedicated to her. She's a Buddhist deity. Um, and she's, you know, temples to her across Beijing and across China. And you often see these statues of her. This is a Blanc de Chine example made from Fujian in the 18th century. Uh, there is in Beijing the Dongyue temple, the god of the Eastern Peak. You can go and visit it today. These are these are my photos. They're really quite fun. This is a Taoist temple. Um, you have around the courtyard full of these steles, these kind of stone inscriptions, these um, kind of replicas of hell. What happens to you when you break the law? And they have all these kind of weird statues, which are really sort of quite fun. Um, Beijing calendar year was punctuated by festivals. People didn't have weekends like we do the seven day week you worked all the way through and you stopped pretty much only when there was a festival and someone in 1758 actually wrote um a record of all the festivals that that that, that, that you could do again so it's quite interesting to sort of look at everything um won't read through all of it but you know various gods birthdays and buddhist temples um and, and things there is also the washing of the elephants. Uh, um, that was a holiday as well, which was really quite interesting. Um, people took a day off to watch elephants being cleaned in the moat. Um, there was ice skating as well. Um, so the Manchus liked ice skating because it was part of their military preparations in the Northeast in the cold, but also quite sort of happy and joyous. And even in Beijing today, you can still see ice skating on the frozen lakes and Beijing opera as well, of course. But um, Professor Goldman will give a lecture later on that. This is the uh, Qianlong Emperor celebrating Chinese New Year with his family, again, sort of showing himself to be a family man. So festivals were really, really important um, part of city life as well as uh, all these temples to Guan Yin and Guan Di, there would have been a large segment of Tibetan Buddhists. There is the Yonghe Gong Palace in the northeast of Beijing. Um, so uh, the Qianlong Emperor and the Qing were, were great founders of Tibetan Buddhism. They portrayed themselves as Tibetan Buddhists, again, to show their universality. Um, you see stupas, Buddhist stupas in Beijing. I mentioned earlier in Beihai Park, they were uh, built by... Um, 
Nepalese craftsmen uh, and builders in the Yuan dynasty, uh, but they continued in the Qing. They like this form. In the middle, you see a cloisonné enamel model of a Buddhist stupa. Um, the stupa on the left is from Beihai Park. The stupa on the right is from uh, Fuxing and West Beijing. There's also Muslims, a large uh, population of Muslims in Beijing at this time. They are Hui, ethnic Han Chinese who are Muslims, but also Central Asians, uh, Uyghurs, Persians, you name it, everything. They're about 2% of the population centered largely around Ox Street. They're still there. And you see, you know, paintings of Kazakhs from uh, Central Asia paying tribute to the Channel Emperor to, uh, forces. There were Christians in Beijing at this time. Uh, by 1700, there were three Catholic churches, as well as two Russian Orthodox churches. Um, so there were Christians at this time. Um, and the Christians... Uh, with them came Italian and, and, and Western European Jesuits uh, from the Society of Jesus to spread the, uh, the, the faith. And one of the most famous is Giuseppe Castiglioni, who went to China and was a very talented painter and was became a court painter. And he painted these beautiful paintings that you see in this room that are again, trompe de l'oeil, they trick the eye, they look like real, they, they introduce Western perspective uh, to something. The Chinese just were, were absolutely fascinated by it. And you see shading and chiaroscuro, like in this uh, picture of flowers here, again by Giuseppe Castiglioni, again, kind of combining Chinese styles and subject matters with Western shading and, and, and realism. And also kind of European style military portraits on horseback. Again, this is something that the Qianlong Emperor here depicted really quite got himself involved. And you even see his favorite concubine in European armor. This is Xiang Fei, who was um, a beloved Uyghur concubine of the Qianlong Emperor. She apparently came from the Western regions, um, but here she is dressed in European uh, armor. So again, showing the fascination with the, with the West at this time. And earlier we saw briefly already the Yongzheng Emperor depicting himself in a kind of Louis XIV wig uh, and, and fighting a tiger. So here they're, 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 they're showing their universality. They're not just, these Manchu emperors are not just emperors of China, they're emperors of the world, you know, they're, they're, they're universal. They are they're the sons of heaven. Again, the kind of interest with Europeans, you see it in cloisonne and enamels, you see it depicted in porcelain as well at this time. Um, there's glass making from this period, um, which are introduced by um, West the, the Jesuits at the same time. The glass workshop was established in the 35th year of Kangxi and guided by Jesuit missionaries. There were Western style palaces um, this is one that was in the summer, the old summer palace, in the northwest of Beijing, designed by Giuseppe Castiglioni and the other Jesuits. Um, this was later destroyed um, by Franco British uh, forces in 1860s. And um, again, this is you know, why it's important to look at the glory, to understand the glory of. Of, of Beijing in the 18th century, so we can understand later the, the, the humiliation, what they felt, and, uh, and, and its importance there. Speaking of foreigners, the Chinese did paintings showing foreigners paying tribute to them. Uh, China believed in a, a sort of foreign policy known as the tribute system, whereas it was the center of the civilized world and other countries came to pay tribute, and in return, you got protection and status and whatnot. That was the system. There wasn't this kind of equal nation states idea that didn't exist. And so the Chinese like to portray themselves um, as the center of the world and, and foreigners coming to, to pay. And it's quite interesting. You've got elephants. And again, I, I'm sorry, going back to elephants, I really love elephants. Elephants were in Beijing. There were elephant stables in, in Xuan Wumen. Uh, they came from Vietnam. They were given as tribute. Um, they were really sort of fascinating things. And you often see them with vases because uh, the, the, the word for vase is ping, which means harmony, and elephant is xiang. So um, to have a vase and elephant together is to have the, 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 uh, a sign of peace and harmony, taiping yong xiang. So it was a very auspicious omen. But elephants were very much part of, of, of the scene in Beijing, and people took time to, to look at them. 
Um, here is another version of the thousand nations coming to pay tribute. And it's, it's difficult to see the details, but here we have Russian delegates um, and then the English. And the English are important because at this time they are trading in Canton in the south. Um, there are many rules. They're not allowed to go wherever they like. Um, they're trying to trade with the Chinese, but there is a huge deficit. They are buying tea and porcelain, um, but the English don't really have anything to, to sell to the Chinese back. And so they're spending huge amounts of silver, which is flowing to China, but they're not getting anything back. Um, later, Lord McCartney is sent on an embassy in 1793 to try and renegotiate with the Qing state and, and, and make it easier for English merchants to trade and try and give them something to sell. Um, and of course, this is satirized by Gilray, a cartoonist later. And it's really sort of you know funny. You've got the Qianlong emperor who's really not amused. And the Lord McCartney is sort of, they've got like a ping pong racket and some toys. And there's a, someone's carrying a hobby horse at the back. You know, they're, they're really trying to impress them and there's not much they're impressed with. And Qianlong Emperor very famously responded. He said, our celestial empire possesses all things in prolific abundance and lacks no product within its borders. There is therefore no need to import the manufactures of outside barbarians in exchange for our own produce. To an extent, he was, he was, he was quite right. Uh, some of the gifts that were given were included Wedgwood porcelain. You know, compared to Chinese porcelain being produced at this time, Wedgwood is, is in my opinion, vastly inferior. But one thing that, and, and, and Qianlong clearly thought the same, but one thing that the Qianlong emperor and the Qing emperors in, in general really liked were clocks. And I just want to show this video here. absolutely amazing clocks, um, really fascinating. And we're gonna have a uh, world authority talking about clocks, Dr. Ian White, later in this series. So do please um, uh, uh, stay to, to listen to him. Um, Kang Shi even wrote a poem about clocks. Uh, he wrote, the skill originated in the West, but by learning we can achieve the artifice. Wheels move and time turns round, hands show the minutes as they change. Red capped watchman, there's no need to announce dawn's coming. My golden clock has warned me of the time. By first light, I am hard at work and keep on asking, why are the memorials late? Again, you know, um, Kang Shi showing himself as a very hard working emperor. So th they did appreciate some gifts coming from the West, especially clocks. And in return, the Chinese sent porcelain, lacquer and jade. These are actually in her Majest uh, his majesty's uh, collection in, 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 in the royal collections and um, so you can see these today in, in the UK. Um, along with the McCartney mission, there were artists like William Alexander that really showed Westerners their first glimpse of Peking uh, and Beijing. And they, you know, they show customs, how people ate, how they transport, how they prayed. Moving on again from the English, I'm aware we're kind of short for time. So I'll try and, and get to, to speed up a bit. Um, there was Japanese lacquer, and it also had an influence. There was officially no trade with Japan at this time in the Qing dynasty, but lacquer did come through via intermediary merchants and was sent. And the Yongzheng emperor loved 
uh, Japanese lacquer and it influenced his style, especially this style of gold, gold on black. This is a, a Yongzheng, actually Qianlong era teapot. Um, and in behind this painting of a lady, you can see there's a black lacquer box with bamboo. Again, it's actually sort of like a Japanese style uh, lacquer box. Again, Qing, this is a Qianlong example of uh, a box imitating, again, Japanese lacquer, and especially that Japanese way of tying uh, things, which uh, Yongzheng and Qianlong Emperor really love, this sort of trompe l'oeil. And you see it often again and again in um, vases, and porcelain, lacquer, in, in many different forms. It's really beautiful, technically brilliant. Um, so there were many markets in Beijing, and, and Beijing was a huge center for luxury items, including wood, ivory, precious stones, jade, cosme lacquer, paintings, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They imported sable and ermine from the northeast and, and the Siberia, green tea and exotic fruits from the south, rare pearls, sweet wines, you know, Asian jades, turquoise. Um, and many of these things were monopolized by the imperial household, but sometimes um, they, they could be sold to, to the public and reach down uh, if you had the right connections to various people. If a piece of porcelain maybe was not bad enough to destroy, but didn't want to keep it, they could sell it. So some pieces did kind of make it to the market. And we see in a painting, Kangxi's 60th birthday procession, uh, there are shops for tobacco, tea, lumber, incense, medicine, grain, and money by 1716. And this is in the inner city, where the city dominated by the bannermen. Uh, apparently, you know, officially, the bannermen are these stoic warriors. You know, they're not supposed to spend their time with luxury items, and, but they are sort of getting a bit soft by this stage. This is uh, the painting. Here's just a few sort of details of it. Um, really sort of fascinating painting. If you want to spend more time, you can see different shops and lanterns, cellars and paintings and things like that. Uh, Beijing opera, there's, you know, someone having an argument somewhere. Um, you see in uh, Xuyang painting, spring comes to the capital, there are shoppers, they're buying robes. So that was uh, another favorite pastime. There's, for entertainment in Beijing, there's Beijing opera. This is really, truly one of the great art forms to um, come from Beijing at this time, and we're going to have a lecture specifically on Beijing opera. There's temple fairs, there's hunting and falconry, there's cricket fighting. Um, you know, people like to raise crickets, the little insects, and then sort of see them fighting. Um, raising pigeons, you used to see this in Beijing until very recently, people would have huge uh, cages with pigeons and playing chess and card games and tea houses. And I have a video from Laosha's tea house in 1957, but I think it really evokes the sounds of what Beijing would have been like at that time. And, and I, so you saw some of the men kind of looking into a, um, into a, 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 into two cylinders, I can't find it, but they were sort of looking at cricket fighting. You have people with bird cages and things like that. Um, and, and, and this chant that he's singing is quite, often you would have had merchants hawking their wares, singing a kind of Chinese rap. And if you notice, he has a lot of this R sound. This is a very Beijing sound. This is typical of the Beijing accent. And in the bottom left, you see um, on this painting here, a detail showing Beijing opera. And uh, with, with the, 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 the um, kind of wigs in the window in the back as well, sort of costumes. Uh, I, we don't have much time, but if I'm, if you can indulge me, I'm on the final thing. I wanted to talk briefly just about government services and just sort of how poor people sort of survived in the city. Um, it was very ad hoc. There were orphanages and soup kitchens funded by the throne, managed by local officials, but it and mostly by Buddhist temples. But it was not. It wasn't really a, a welfare system as such. It depended on the whim of the ruler as a gift. It was no, there was no institution really to save them. And so we see an earthquake in 1730, uh, the Yongzheng emperor gave 30,000 ounces of silver to each of the banner. His priority is to the bannermen, to the banners, the Manchu banners, the, the warriors that live in Beijing. Only on the second day, he instructed the city censor to survey the rest of the population and estimated what was needed. So, so long as uh, there was money in the coffers, when things went wrong, they could give it out. But later on, this wasn't effective uh, in the 19th century when uh, coffers kind of dry up. 
And in summer of 1743, we, we hear that there were 10,000 people said to have collapsed during a crippling heat. There was a really heat wave. And the Qianlong Emperor issued 1,000 uh, ounces of silver to the city gates to give them uh, ice water and medicines and things like that. There were soup kitchens, uh, Fan Chan or George Chan, they opened every year in winter, uh, initially 10, but grew in number. They dispensed porridge, millet, and they were free of charge. They could feed 2,000 people a day. So there was some sense of welfare. Um, they could be opened longer or shorter periods of time, depending on the crisis. And finally, just go moving on to sort of sectarians and witch hunts. There's a really fascinating thing that happened in 1768. There was a sorcery scare. So we saw the kind of the brilliance of the Qianlong reign and the art and, and, and amazing things and clocks, but there were serious um, kind of um, cracks in the state and, and Chenlong was becoming increasingly paranoid and fearful of when um, several stonemasons and beggars and monks were apparently charged with sorcery in central and eastern China. And they did this by cutting off other people's cues and apparently when they cut off the hair, they were stealing the soul of the person. And indeed, this is actually quite common, uh, Lu Banjing, which is uh, the classic of Lu, a handbook on architecture and carpentry from the Ming period, actually contains a section for dealing with spells and how to deal with that. Um, so that's the Manchu Q. And the, the, this was obligatory, Chinese had to have it. If you cut the Q, it was said, you cut your head, <laughs> keep the hair or keep your head, cut the hair and you, you lose your head. So cutting it was a serious issue. And uh, Qianlong, again, wrote a sort of long letter to the provincial officials. And it's really interesting to see how he kind of dealt with uh, public disorder. Don't have time to read it, but, but you have after the sale. But the cutting of queues would eventually lead to the end of the Qing dynasty in 1911, 1912. And so this was this really sort of sensitive issue that really sort of begins in the Qianlong reign. And that's, I think, all we have time for today. So I will stop it there. Wonderful. Edward, thank you so much for that immersive, holistic, and as with all the lectures you provide for us on the Sonar Southwood Postgraduate Diploma, incredibly thoroughly researched and at times kind of granular and deeply human and deeply personal take on the, on the topic you're speaking to us today. It was a pleasure to listen to. Thank you very much. So I, as, as the, the kind of Q&A chair and program director, I'll, I'll kind of take my prerogative and, and ask the first question, as it were. Um, but those of you who do have questions, please pose them in the Q&A box in the lower right hand corner of your screen. But let me start with my, my own question, first of all. So in that diverse panoply of materials, artworks, objects, peoples, cultures, languages, all of these things that we've seen, religions and so many more things, there was a, a kind of an overwhelming range of 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 different cultures. And my, my question to you is perhaps deceptively simple. To what extent was Beijing in the 18th century a multicultural place in which these different cultures coexisted? And to what extent was it a space that led to the integration and synthesis of these cultures, creating new and distinctive art forms and objects that embodied cross-fertilization between that diversity of Manchu, Tibetan, uh, European and predominantly Han Chinese elite and vernacular cultures. So how much how much of it is coexistence under Manchu rule and how much of what we see in 18th century Beijing is a synthetic range of, of, of new things that were, were happening at that time? Wow, that's a really big question. <laughs> um, I'm going to sort of cop out a little bit and sort of say, well, I, I'm, but it's true. I actually think it's a little bit of both. Um, I'm sorry if that's so sort of disappointing. It's it's coexistence and it's synthetic. There's synthetic on so many. I, I mean, there's just so. It, it's hard to include everything, but you also get sort of porcelain and bronze incense vessels with Arabic inscriptions on them as well from, from Muslim community. You've got the Tibetan Buddhist implements. Um, so clearly, and 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 archaic items. So I believe it's in synthesizing everything as well. And I think clearly for the Manchu emperors, they saw no difference between the Qing empire and China. In fact, they kind of wanted to refer to it always at the same. Um, so, but also coexistence as well. I mean, the Manchu emperors had to balance. They, they were aware 
of the brilliance of Chinese culture and the need and importance of, of, of synthesizing, but they didn't want to synthesize too much. They wanted to keep a little bit of their own Manchu identity. And occasionally the Chenlong emperor would say, oh, you know, you've got to keep, you know, doing hunting practice and archery practice and keep your Manchu traditions alive. But it, it you know, to what extent it's always debatable. And there's many different scholars with different views. Was it you know, synthesized or coexistence. So I, I don't know if that answers it, but I'm, I'm a bit of a cop out. I'm, I think it's a bit of both. Well, I think that's that's kind of inevitable in some cases, but perhaps I can press on this question again and say, thinking about the other, the topics coming our way over the next seven weeks, the the introduction to Manchu culture, looking at the, uh, the clocks and the automata, looking at the textiles and so many other themes that we'll be covering in this course. Where do you, where from that range of topics would you see a strong example of kind of, retained cultural integrity where what's something we're going to see a kind of an object or an artwork type that shows the continuity of a distinctive culture under manchu rule and what's an example of something that is the the synthesis something where we're going to see different currents running together to create something novel and and original under the ching from these from these topics that we're going to look at yeah. over the next few weeks i think really probably uh, textiles would be the most obvious thing where you're going to see something that's truly manchu um, of course, there's some elements of Chinese motifs like dragons and, 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 and sim auspicious symbols that are incorporated in that. But essentially, the Manchu dress is very distinct uh, from anything previous in the Ming dynasty, not just the hairstyle, but so therefore the headgear and wearing of fur. You know, the wearing of fur, um, obviously, Manchus coming from the Northeast Culture regions, it was, you know, normal. But to the Han Chinese, wearing fur was something barbarian. It was really something kind of you know not done. Um, the, the 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 kind of lavish use of pearls. These pearls probably would have came from the Amur River, uh, Sungari River in the northeast. So wearing of fur, wearing of pearls um, would have been very sort of considered very Manchu. And the style of dress, the the kind of horse hoof cuffs, as it were. That, so I think the the objects we'll see in Jacqueline Simcox's uh, lecture, the textiles there will perhaps showcase, I think, more very strong Manchu. And also the, the, the Manchu women didn't bind their feet. They were forbidden from binding their feet, but they did have um, shoes that imitated the movements of, of, of someone with bound feet. They're kind of like on stilts almost to sort of mimic, make it harder for them to walk as it were, uh, so that they could look like they had bound feet in a way. So that's, a, I, I, I don't know, I think that's quite Manchu. Um, something synthetic, I think we will see that um, in uh, Nicole Chang's lecture on court culture, um, when uh, she will be probably looking at porcelain and uh, lacquer and, uh, and paintings perhaps, and how the court really tried to integrate itself with Han Chinese culture and synthesize things. Uh, I think porcelain is really interesting to see the kind of synthesis and new forms coming from this period. Um, some people, consider it perhaps a bit too over the top. It's very Rococo. I mean, it is the same period, um, but you've got sort of European influences, acanthus leaves and things like that. And you've also got traditional Chinese uh, motifs from archaic designs and shapes and forms with new glazes and new colors. And sometimes, you know, you get the feeling Chenlong just couldn't decide and just put everything. There's a bit of celadon, blue and white, uh, whatever, all in one vase. So I think, you know, uh, yeah, you'll see the synthesis there. Thank you. Um, so we have a question now from Carl Strelka, um, course participant and one of our postgraduate diploma alumni, who asks, where exactly was the room with the murals of architectural scenes by Giuseppe Castiglione? So perhaps we can go back to that in the... Yeah. Um, and secondly, he seems to have such a large output. Did he have a large workshop, perhaps with local assistance? Thank you. Yeah, Carl. absolutely. Let me just try and go back. How do I... Forgive me, I'm... So you exit the slideshow and then restart, okay. and then we can go backwards this way. Sorry for everyone to kind of go, it was quite far back. I probably overdid it with the 130 slides, but I, I was quite zealous in wanting to show everyone. There's, okay. I think it shows the richness of the material that you're covering, Edward, so. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, so this was, um, there was actually a documentary called, uh, which you can find on YouTube, called The Emperor's Secret Garden. And this was uh, built in the back northeast of the Forbidden City, I believe. 
And this was originally built as a retirement pavilion for the Channel Emperor. The Channel Emperor um, actually retired. He didn't want to reign longer than his grandfather that had ruled for 60 years. He was going to live longer, though, but he said uh, out of filial piety and I'm sure out of tiredness, um, he sort of said, I'm going to retire. And so he wanted to build himself a special place for him to relax and read. So this is within the Forbidden City in Beijing itself in the northeast. Um, I'm not sure. I can't remember. I'm sorry, the exact uh, name of the pavilion uh, right now, but, but you can find it on YouTube, the Emperor's Secret Garden. Um, and they talk about how they refurbished it and how they built it. It's actually where I took the, the clip of the uh, clocks. Uh, hopefully no one from the BBC is going to sue me for that. <laughs> and yes, sorry, the second part of the question is there was, uh, there would definitely have been a workshop. Um, he was not working alone. Um, he taught Chinese artists the, the technique and Chinese artists learned from it and then they played with it. And one of the things that we had in the auction house uh, last year, we had a painting of a bannerman, um, but it wasn't as good as some of the other paintings of bannermans, which had this very Western style. So here you see kind of the very Western style face, amazingly painted, you know. So this is kind of considered under the direction of Giuseppe Castiglioni. Um, and other Jesuit painters at that time. And then we had another painting like this, but just not as good. And so it was clear that it was later Chinese artists that were sort of imitating that style, but just didn't, didn't have the, the, the guiding hand of the master as it would show them. So it definitely would have been part of the workshop. Thank you very much, Edward. Um, so as I wait for more questions to come in from the, uh, from the class, um, class members, um, I have a follow-up question for you myself. Um, given that this course is offered in association with Asian Art in London, um, I wanted to ask for those of our audience, I, I know many of you are dispersed across the world. We have uh, people joining us from across Southeast Asia, from North America, from Florence, from, uh, from many other places as well. Um, but as we are formally associated with Asian Art in London in delivering this programme, and Edward, next week, I believe, is your, your preview at, at Bonhams, is that correct? So next for those in London... Up. Are you setting, are you setting up now? Setting up and then we're open from, um, um, from I think, the Saturday and Sunday, yes. Yeah. My, my question is a very simple one. Can we visit you? And what kinds of things uh, from the 18th century might we see in, in that, it, were we to visit you at, at, at Bonhams in London? Absolutely, absolutely. You can visit me. Um, I'm actually delivering a lecture, again, uh, as part of Bonhams um, on October the 29th at 2 p.m. at Bonham's New Bond Street. Um, I'll be giving a lecture on narratives on porcelain from the 17th century um, in the Marsh collection. So it's not the 18th century, but there is a bit of overlap. Uh, actually, we are, I will be talking a lot about a Kangxi, a Kangxi era brush pot, which I actually showed in this, um, in this lecture. So, you know, and it's worth, quite a significant amount of money. It's one of the highlights. So 200,000 pounds, that's gonna be there uh, from the Kangxi reign and we'll show how he, you know, what I talked about. So that will be there. Uh, we have uh, a lot of monochrome porcelain. Um, so you'll, please do come and have a look and handle these things. It, in, in some ways it's better than a museum because you can touch these things and feel the weight of them and get a, a sense of it, you know, how delicate they are. So we, we're going to have a lot of porcelain from the 18th century. Um, and I think, yes, mo this time mostly porcelain. That, that's the big. Thank you. That's big great. Thing. Um, so alongside Edward's employer, of course, um, as this program is associated with Asian Art in London writ large, do take a look at their um, their website for a full listing of all the online and in-person events taking place in London for those of you who can who can access those. Um, we have time for one final question, which has just come in um, before we need to, to, um, to kind of let Edward go as it were and thank him for this wonderful opening to the short course. Um, uh, Yamin Hite asks us, um, I am curious if we can have a chance to see any exotic multicultural art objects, especially initiated by Jesuit and Muslim cultures in 18th century Beijing. So we've seen the Jesuits, I suppose, in some of Carl's examples, but are there is there a similar kind of synthesis or cross-cultural flourishing um, occurring on Ox Street um, that you, you flagged for us there? Yeah, um, there is. Um, I, I think what we often see a lot is uh, bronze utensils um, 
and vessels with Arabic inscriptions um, in the 18th century as well. It, it, it comes before in the Ming dynasty, but um, often we see that as well in the auction house quite a lot. Uh, incense burning sets, um, you know, and, and utensils with Arabic inscriptions. I'm trying to sort of think other things. We had, we sold um, a gun actually from the Qing dynasty. I think it was in Bonhams, Hong Kong. And that was a, it was not, it was a particular style of gun that had come via inner Asia from Central Asia. And so that was again, a kind of showing Muslim influence. I think really the, the greatest synthesis of Muslim culture with Qing court culture though can be found in jades, uh, specifically Mughal jades from Mughal India. Uh, which have these kind of floral patterns and things like that, incredibly translucent, really fine. I, I could show it briefly. Uh, I showed one of the Mughal jades um, and with a Chinese inscription on top. Um, but, but Chinese craftsmen copied those jades from Mughal and Central Asia and, and made their own versions as well. They didn't just simply inscribe on it. They, they, they kind of incorporated elements from a bit of both. So you see Mughal jades. I think that's probably... Uh, Perhaps we could go back to that slide. So just just as we had so such a rich visual presentation. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Let's try and uh, find it. You see, this is very typical Mughal, this kind of very florid, very thinly carved jade. Um, until the Chinese saw this, they didn't really carve so thinly. And they were really impressed by that. The Qianlong Emperor really loved Indian jades. Um, you know, and... Um, this, you know, the, the, this, the, the, these kind of uh, acanthus leaves on the outside, again, a very typically Indian, South Asian. I mean, actually, there's there's a lot of work still to be done on this and things that we typically just called Mughal jade, uh, some scholars are now saying came from other parts of Central Asia, which maybe we just didn't know. Some people are even talking about Ottoman jades. Um, so there's a lot of you know, things that were just all lumped together as Mughal Jade, actually, there, there's a lot more research to be done there that can be can be studied, but that's definitely one big field. Fantastic. Thank you, Edward. Well, one one final question then, if I may, uh, that's just come in sure. briefly from, from Carl again, who asks, I'm fascinated by the Ming holdouts, but these people must all be far from life in Beijing, or are there also holdouts there? So holdouts, I presume, is referring to the kind of the remnant loyalists, the Imin, as they're often described, like Bada Shanran and others that you highlighted for us in the Jiangnan region. Yes. The, so, but sorry, what was the question? What about the the, the Ming loyalists, were, how they were survived? There, were there Ming loyalists in Beijing as well as in other areas? It's difficult to, to really tell. There may indeed have been, but if they were too open, they would have been executed. Uh, if you were too open about it, uh, I'm sure there were people secretly in their own heads and minds thinking what they thought about the Manchus uh, and, and these new rulers. Um, but as in many parts today, you can't truly always express yourself. Um, so in Beijing, I'm sure there were. We just you wouldn't know. It, it, it just it was it would have been. It's, it's very difficult. You, of course, I think the center of Ming loyalism is probably the scholar elites in Jiangnan writing these poems, exactly like kind of what we saw a little bit earlier uh, with Yuan Mei and his friend. There was one poem talking about, you know, uh, the red flowers and the king of the flowers and things like that. So I think there were scholars still um, in Jiangnan that probably resented still. Manchu overlords but it's really too difficult to tell it, 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 you know if they were too open they would have been killed so I think also with the literary inquisition and the mass destruction of writings that you allude to the the potential for yeah, yeah. it implies that there was still a threat that there were and actually I mean I, to, to go back to the to the end so I'm jumping back and forward there was that sorcery scare it was more than just a sorcery scare. It, it had ethnic and political dimension to it because it was it was specifically related to the cutting of cues. Um, and so, you know, here, I think maybe we can just quickly see what Chen Long wrote about it. And, and it shows his fear and his paranoia about people that were still quite anti-Manchu. In the Zhejiang region, it is said that when bridges are being constructed, some persons are secretly clipping such things as people's hair and lapels for the purpose of casting spells 
to sinking the pilings. Now, this belief has spread into Shandong. These rumors are truly absurd. It may be just petty thieves using the occasion to cast suspicion on others so that they may more brazenly play their clever tricks. However, this kind of false story can easily delude and incite the public. Naturally, it should be rigorously investigated and forbidden in order to put an end to evil customs. Uh, let it be known to the governor generals and governors in those jurisdictions that they are to order their subordinates secretly to undertake a thorough investigation. If this situation really exists, the culprit should be arrested forthwith and punished severely. Or it may be that arresting and severely punishing one or two ringleaders will serve as a warning to the others. Also, they must proceed as if nothing momentous were happening, conduct their investigations in a proper manner, and not permit the Yamin underlings to get involved and use the occasion to stir up trouble. I mean, Chen Long here is really very sensitive to the issue of these sorcerers, people accused of sorcery cutting cues. It was clearly had a political dimension. It's the elephant in the room. He doesn't openly say it. He says, okay, we've got to really try and keep it quiet, but these people can spread and they can start cutting cues everywhere. And so I think there is secretly uh, a great paranoia and fear um, still going on. Thank you. I think that this is such a, a kind of visceral, powerful example of that, that you... Um... We'll translate and provide for us his text here. And, and just for a bit of context on the geography, for those who aren't so immediately familiar with the, the maps of Chinese provinces, if this starts in Zhejiang and moves to Shandong, the implicit narrative there is it's coming toward the capital, but isn't here yet. That's um, right. In its directions. So Edward, that I think has taken us slightly over time, but we did have a slightly late start. Um, so thank you all so much for the wonderful questions you've posed, the really um, rich and engaged conversations that we're, we're gonna have over the next few weeks are, are one of the real highlights for me of these, these courses we run both online and in person. So do, um, uh, do come and attend live where you can, and do bring your questions. And if you cannot pose those questions, please send them to myself and Patrick Munger in advance, and we'll make sure that they're posed to the speaker so you can hear them on the recording. Uh, we want to make sure we include you, whether you're joining us synchronously or asynchronously. Um, so before I say a couple of final words of thanks to, to Edward, I just want to, to kind of situate this wonderful short course in the broader offering of the postgraduate diploma in Asian art. Indeed, the SOAS Alfwood postgraduate diploma in Asian art that I have the privilege to direct. We run a series of short courses throughout the year, both online and in person. And this year, um, we have picked three distinctive topics um, for our online courses that take us, as we have seen today, into uh, a deep dive, as it were, into the, the arts and cultures of a particular city in a particular time. Uh, we're beginning here with Beijing in the 18th century. We're moving on uh, to look at the um, uh, the Ottoman world in, in um, early in the new year with more announcements and details on that forthcoming with Chiara Di Nicolai. Um, and then we're moving on finally to um, uh, to a, a section looking at Lucknow with Dr. Emily Shovelton, spanning the, I believe, the 18th and 19th centuries. So I'm hugely excited to have this distinctive and very rich and diverse range of, of art forms that we can share and explore with all of you this year in our online courses. And many thanks to Edwards uh, to Edward for inaugurating that that program of. Um, uh, of short courses for us today with a wonderfully immersive, engaging and animated lecture, rich in content, but uh, refined in detail. And I look forward to continuing to work with you in the, the weeks ahead to deliver what promises to be a hugely exciting program for, for all of our attendees. Thank you once again, Edward. Thank you very much, Malcolm. Thank you everyone in the audience for listening. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Have a good day.